I'd like you to look at Hebrews chapter 2 that Charles read to us from Hebrews 2, 14. And we'll also take a look at Hebrews 4, 14. The two great sections on the sympathetic high priesthood of Christ. About this time every year, they play the Wizard of Oz on uh, Christmas programs. And... One of the most interesting parts is when they appear, the, the four sojourners, Dorothy and her pals, appear before the wizard. And they're asking for things. I need a heart. I need a brain. I need courage. I want to go home. I mean, the wizard, you remember how he does? He always just scorns them because he has no concept of what it is to be like they are. He is a disembodied wizard. Uh, he says to the ten man, you clinking, clanking collection of collisionous junk. He has no concept of a heart. He says to the, the scarecrow, you billowing bag of bovine fodder. Just big bag of hay. The lion, he didn't even get a retort. He just jumps smooth out the window. If you remember, he's terrified. Dorothy, he doesn't care about her. Because he's a wizard, and he only experiences what wizards experience, that he has no concept, he cannot sympathize. There is no same pain, sympathos. He does not feel what we feel. And sometimes we can think this about God, that you are eternal, you are vast, you are not confined by space or by knowledge or by weakness. There is nothing, the word impossible is, in, is not in your vocabulary, but are you concerned with me, little old me? When you take a look at this universe and it comes down to this planet and here's this continent, here's this state, here's this city and somewhere there is stuck off in this bedroom me. All 100 or 200 or whatever pounds of me. Do you really care when I talk? Or are you just kind of like Santa Claus, a phantasm for children to be comforted in the dark? Well, we're talking here about not just the infinitude of God, but the infinitesimalness of God. Not the vastness of God, but the smallness of God. Not the infinitude, but the personability of God. Not just the unity, but the tri-unity, that he's a person. Now, you don't get this wizardliness idea from the Bible. You go back to the creation, and there is God making land, sea, sky, outer space, and he makes uh, fish, birds, mammals, man perfectly adapted for their form. For where he will put the fullness in the form, it's perfectly adapted. You ever examined a fin or a feather, the interlocking barbs on a feather? It's amazing. You ever uh, just examine the arch on a foot Why your big toe is out here? Then it goes to them funny looking toes and then back in. There's a reason. It's a perfect plantar movement. If you don't have it, you miss the military and you got flat feet and it hurts and we got to do something to simulate that in art support. God makes us a certain way. Every one of us. He codes it in to the DNA because he's concerned with the individual. Whenever Christ talked about God concerned about sparrows and lilies, it wasn't just talk. He made them for land and sky because he's a good God. At the end of every day of the creation, it's good. When it's all done, it's very good. His sustaining grace, you have got atmosphere, um, oxygen. We breathe it in, breathe out CO2. Are we going to run out? No, because plants breathe in CO2, they breathe out oxygen. Funny how that works. 
that you've got earth right here. What are they going to eat? We've got dirt. And you put water on that dirt and it makes it soluble and it permeates the viscosity of a, of a seed. And all of a sudden that water will make it germinate. And then it will come up gradually. And you can harvest it. You can eat it. And your body will assimilate it. you got a tooth that will bite it and tear it and grind it and crunch it. Why is that? Because God, he didn't have to eat and have teeth, but we do. He put salivary glands so you don't have to get a toilet plunger and <laughs> force it down. Wouldn't that be a drag? Have your waiter say, can I bring your plunger, sir? You got peristaltic action. They'll take it right down. How would you like to pass all that stuff you put in your mouth? Did he say that in church? Yes, he did. I believe he did. <laughs> no, but you got this stuff down there that'll turn it into a, a liquid. You've got, it'll absorb it in your body. What you don't need, we'll just leave it right there. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> what kind of God does that? That is a very personal, good God. The nation of Israel. Here's your land. Here's your tribes. Here's where they belong. There's guys in the land. I'm going to remove them. I'm going to give you land. And I'm going to give you a nation. I'm going to give you a blessing. And he could bear their miseries no longer when they did bad. I'm going to give you law. I'm going to You're going to take care of the widows and the orphans. You take care of the poor. It's going to rain in the spring. It's going to rain in the fall. Count on it. Plan Passover and plan uh, the... Uh, Feast of Booths, trust me, you're going to celebrate. I'm going to sprinkle the land. I'll take care of it. That's our great God. And yet in the New Testament, and specifically the book of Hebrews, it gives us an even greater picture of God's sympathy, of his tenderness, of his individuality-ness toward people. You know, the Bible is not full of just the story of this continent or the story of this civilization. It's Ruth. It guys like Gideon, Deborah, Barak, David, Ishmael, uh, Solomon, Rahab, Paul, Timothy. The Bible's littered with these people it's not just concepts, law, prophets. No, it filters down to just regular guys like you and I. Isn't that amazing? And yet in the book of Hebrews, it puts the nail punch on individuality. It sinks it. It's not that the New Testament makes God sympathetic. God is in no need of improvement but it makes certain ideas more clear and tangible. The incarnation, incarnate, in flesh, he's one of us. He doesn't just appear to us. He enters through a womb. He's a zygote, a fetus. He's an embryo. He's a baby, a three-year-old, 12-year-old, young man. He goes to the death everything that we go through. Christmas, the incarnation, is the Bible's ultimate affirmation to us that I care about you. Not y'all, simply. But I care about you. When the doctor says, I'm looking at your x-ray, you need to come in. When you start through that MRI tube and it starts clanking and buzzing and the girl yells in, lay still. God, awful tight in here. Are you here? You know what I'm going through? When your kid is ill, God, when you get that phone call at 3 a.m., God, 
Are you here? Well, that's what Christmas teaches. Hebrews 2.14. After saying in verse 12 and 13 that we are, verse 12 of chapter 2, the brethren of Christ, we are in 13, the children of God, he the begotten, we the adopted, that in verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same. This was a thought by the church leaders back in the 5th, 6th century when they were having to come up with the doctrine of the humanity of Jesus. How does the divine and the human go together? Is he, how human is he? And their, one of their great passages was this passage. Since the children are flesh and blood, he, to save them, has to become one of them. And they offered the, the idea, they coined the phrase, that what God will save, God must become. Do you get that? What God will save, God must become to save it. And so the author says, he partook of the same in order that through death he could render powerless him who had the power of death, the devil. He defeated Satan at the cross. And then in verse 15, that he might, the word is, take hold of, he can now reach into Satan's den and he can grab you by the scruff of your neck and he can free you and take you out. We who had fear of death because we were guilty, we were slavery to sin all of our lives. He had to die that he could reach in and disengage Satan, take us, pull us out, and save us. In verse 16, he doesn't give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. There was a teaching at this time called Gnosticism that Christ wasn't a man, he just appeared like a man, called docetism. He just, dokeo, he just appeared like a man, and it made him more like an angel. And the author says, no, he wasn't an angel because he didn't come to save angels. If he'd have come to save angels, he'd have just become an angel and died for angels. But he didn't. He came to save humans, the son of Abra the, the descendant of Abraham, to take hold of him. So he became one of us. He here, in a kind of a um, subliminal way, shoots down the Gnostic heresy, the docetic heresy of Christ, only looking like a human, but not really being one. No, he didn't come to give help to angels. He came to give help to the son of Abraham. Therefore, in verse 17, he had. The Greek says he was obligated. Ophelia. He was obligated. It was the law written on the stone table. If you've ever seen Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. It was the law. He had to become like his brethren in all things. A human body. A human mind that occasionally could be informed by his omniscience, but he had to play by our rules. He had to learn. A human soul that felt and did not want to be tortured, but said, not in my will, but thine. A human will that had to submit himself. He was like us in all things, only from sin apart. That he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation to die in order for him to die disengage Satan reach in take us out save us he had to be made like us God can't save what he doesn't become in all things don't try to write this down but here's the thoughts of the church fathers to save man God must die for man and he must be a sinless man. In other words, he can have no sin of his own to die for. But he must be a proven sinless man. A real sinless man. Not a fabrication. He has to be tempted in all things. He has to have a will and an intellect. He has to be just like us. He has to play by our rules. 
He has to be sinless, but it has to be a sinlessness that he played out from the womb all the way until a, a torturous death. It has to be a real sinlessness. And he must provide a legal righteousness to be imputed to us. A righteousness that is real. That is lived out as obedient in the face of real temptations. Salvation had to be forged in the fires of this life by that being. He had to lay aside his glory and take to himself humanity and be like one of us. If he would be a sinless sacrifice, he had to live it out. If he would impart to us divine righteousness, he had to forge it out. Perfection had to be lived. Righteousness had to be earned by him. He had to be tested. In other words, Jesus was not Clark Kent. Clark Kent looked like a man. But was he a man? No, he's from Krypton. He just looks like one of us. He doesn't get hungry. He doesn't get cold. He doesn't get frightened. Even gravity doesn't impress him. He just looks like one. Hey, you're Superman. No, I'm Clark Kent. Stupidest brunette that ever lived. Lois <laughs> Lane. That's what you got to have to be a superhero. And because of that, he can be, verse 17, a sympathetic high priest. Verse 17, he can become a merciful high priest. I don't just save you, I know you. And if you'll look at the next verse, he was tempted in all that he was suffered. He's able to come to the aid. That word, come to the aid, means run to the shout. You ever said that to God? Come and running. Help. You just shout. I'll be there. A number of years ago, a couple in our church had a Downs child. We have a number of Downs children. A couple had a Downs child. And it was, as always, it's scary. What do I do here? Well, they thanked me because they got a call from Gene Stallings. Y'all know who Gene Stallings is? Coached the Texas A&M Aggies, coached the Dallas Cowboys assistant. He, he, was, he was, took Alabama to a national title. That was Gene Stallings, one of the great, from Paris, Texas, one of the great coaches ever come out of Texas, high school or college, pro, no matter. Gene Stallings and his wife had a son, had all of his dreams for this son, little Johnny, and he was born Downs. Back in the days when they weren't quite sure about what a Downs child was. And it crushed him that this boy would never be able to play the stuff he wanted him to play. And he came to find out that this boy came to be the greatest delight in his life. He said, except for little excursions here and there, he was like a perfect child. He was affectionate and loving. And, and he said, I would not have traded this boy with his infirmity for any kid in the world. He said he was the delight of my life. Matter of fact, kind of like uh, Roy and Rogers and Dale Evans had the little girl that they wrote the book, Angel Unaware. Like an angel unaware. Well, this couple had a Downs child. And they called me and they thanked me for calling because I knew Gene Stallings from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Gene Stallings called him, him and his wife, out of the blue. I've heard that you've had a child with Down syndrome. I want to tell you something about this child. And by the end of that conversation, the couple said their hearts were soaring from the call. Why did he call them? He was sympathetic. They hurt and he felt it. They thanked me and I said, I'd love to take credit for it. But the fact is, I don't know how to get a hold of Gene Stone. To this day, we don't know how Gene Stallings knew. I personally think that he had a setup with a hospital. 
If there's a Downs child born, I want to know. Because my wife and I are calling them. And we're going to take them at their most painful moment. We're going to take them through. Well, that's the high priest we have. I may be a big, important person, but there's nobody like you. And I feel what you feel. In verse 14 of chapter 4, He tells you in verse 14, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, hold fast your confession. Don't you back off on being a Christian when it gets tough. Paul said Jesus made the good confession in the presence of Pontius Pilate. He made his confession when the scourge was coming out. He said our Savior is a hero. And so since we have a Savior that didn't just come and stay in heaven. He passed through heaven. He came. He became one of us. He went to a cross. You hang tough. He's going to say later on. Uh, Run with endurance the race set before you. Looking to Jesus. The author and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him. Glory endured the cross. Despising the shame. Don't you grow weary and lose heart. We got a nail pierced cap. So you hang tough. Verse 15, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness. We don't have the wizard. We have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So draw near and draw near with confidence to this place of infinite power, this throne, because it's a throne of grace that we, plural pronouns, No discretion. Everybody. He'll receive mercy and find grace to help. I may not take it away, but I can take you through it. James says he gives a greater grace. I'll make you man up. I'll turn this trial into something that'll turn you into something that we've never seen. You just trust me. You just call. Because I know what you're yelling before you've already yelled it. I'm three moves ahead of you. I know where you are. And I'm with you. You call out. When I went through my first death as a kid, I guess I was 11, 12 years old. Never been around death. My grandmother died of a stroke. I remember being in a funeral home. Uh... Conley Funeral Funeral Home down in Waco, Texas. And I looked up and there's that casket. And there's my grandmother laying still. You know what got me through it? Johnny Unitas. Who knows who Johnny Unitas is? I read in my Johnny Unitas biography that Johnny Unitas lost a father when he was young. And I lost a grandmother. And I kept telling myself, Johnny's been through this. I wore Johnny Unitas' high top shoes. I wore his number. I got a flat top. I wanted to be John Unitas. And when I knew Johnny had been through this, what took me through it is that what I was feeling, Johnny felt. And Johnny made it. And I could make it. Isn't that funny? But that's the way we are. Well... Grace to help. You want to hear a sad verse? Here's what you get if you're an idol. Remember the showdown between God and Baal on Mount Carmel, Elijah's day? Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself, prepare it first for your many. Call on the name of your God. Put no fire under it. They took the ox which was given them, they prepared, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered They leaped about the altar that they made. It came about at noon. Elijah mocked them, said, call out with a loud voice. He's a God. Either he's occupied or he's gone aside. He's just busy. Maybe he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep. Needs to be awakened. So they cried with loud voices and they cut themselves, seeing if they could arouse him by pain. I'm bleeding down here, Baal. 
with swords and lances until the blood gushed out. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. No one was there. But when we call, we have a high priest who sympathizes. I've been there. I've been there. I've felt it. You need a heart. I remember having to face something that was painful. I prayed all night. You need a brain, scarecrow. I remember having to face things that did not always make sense. And I had to trust that God would take me through it. You lonely Dorothy, I'm away from my home. You scared lion, I've got hundreds of men with swords and lances and torches coming to get me. The cup that the Father has given me, shall I withdraw? No, I shall say, thy will be done. And so he has faced it for us. But the fact is, we still ask, God, do you know what I'm going through? Pain isn't an, an elective. It's required curriculum. The only people that are totally, completely happy are people that do commercials. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You watch a commercial, you say, that's heaven. Man, it's just the best time. They're just having a great time. They're, it's marvelous. Until they say, cut. Now, when you go into that MRI tube, and you don't know what it's going to show. When your mate hooks them, and you're alone. When your mate dies, and you're alone. When the biopsy comes up positive, and we're going to cut, we're going to do chemo, we're going to do radiation, then we'll see. God love you if you've ever had depression and you feel the light go off from the inside and you're trying to feel. You feel like you're dying from the soul out. If you've had a rogue child sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child. He who begets a fool begets him to her shame. If Jacob marries a Canaanite like these daughters of Heth to Esau, what good will my life be, a mother said. If you've had a chronic anything, a back, migraines, a stroke, fibromyalgia, blindness, if you've had anything that is chronic, uh, you know what it is to hurt. If you've ever had a child suffering and you can't do anything, you just stand there. If you've ever had an injustice done to you and been done wrong with no recourse, Hagar said, Thou art a God who sees, for I have remained alive after seeing him. He saw me. You're going to have a child, we're going to call him Ishmael, Shema, to hear, because God heard you when you called out. You didn't see anybody, but I heard you. And you name him, God heard. You know, back in the late 1800s, Fuhrbach of Germany and Freud, his contemporary, they felt that God did not make man in his image, that man made God in his image. And that from time immemorial, this evolved creature called man, to give himself a standard and rules to govern society, would impute onto nature his idea of a deity. 
It started with the Baals and nature gods. Then it went to the more sophisticated gods of the Romans and the Greeks, which weren't any different than them. And then the Jews came up with the concept of an immaterial God that was only one, that was just like man, only perfect. And that was the perf perfectly evolutionary finality of man's development of God. And they would say, you did not, God didn't make you in his image. Man over years made God in his image. And the final stage is the God of Jesus. Isn't that slick? And they introduced atheism, that the true God is man, master race. You ever heard of World War II? It came out of that. And Darwin threw his bit in, and Hegel threw his bit in, and that's what you had. And the thought of Freud is, all God is, is man's father image on nature. It is a God that is just too good to be true. Well, he's too, he's too good not to be true. It just so happens that the highest of all ideas, an infinite being concerned with lilies. And it was Sherlock Holmes who said to Watson, he said, Watson, this flower is not good for a whole lot. You can't really eat it. It's of no great medicinal value, but it's lovely. And he said to Watson, what kind of God makes a flower? Simply for a human to look at for a moment and smile. And he said to him, we have much to hope because of flowers. Isn't that good? Well, we have a God that was alone. You ever been left alone? We have a God that has been forsaken. Have you ever been forsaken? He's been there. You have a God that had a family and disbelieve in him? He's been there. You ever been distressed to the point of death? He's been there. You ever been betrayed? You ever been lied about, misunderstood, beaten? misunderstood, died? You ever faced the cup of what you did not do? Wherever you have been, this deity has been there. And he says, you come and run it. I'm here for you. But you need to remember something. 12 o'clock. I'm going to give you 18 things. <laughs> I ain't kidding. <laughs> because the sympathetic priesthood of Jesus is marvelous, but you need to remember some things. That number one, he is a God, he's not a genie. Daddy needs some shoes. Needs some money, need a lot of money. That's a genie. You don't have to be faithful, even good. You just rub the lamp. Now, a lot of times when we want relief, we want, we want morphine. My comfort is not as paramount to God as my character. And so when I call to Him, it may not be instant relief. It may be, but it may not be. He's not a genie. He grants us, number two, what is called, when we call, he grants us patient enduring. If we are afflicted, Paul said, it is for your comfort. That we got hurt that we could help you. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort. All we go through is for you. Comfort which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings that we suffer. 2 Corinthians 1, 6. It's effective in patient enduring. God, you're giving me the strength to be up to the task. 
James, he gives a greater grace. God, give me grace. Three times I sought God to take it away. Three times he said, no, my grace is sufficient. I'll take you through this. Number three, you continue to pour out your heart. Be honest. When do you pray the most? When times are great or when times are tough? Well, honey, I got the raise. I'm going to go outside to worship for a while. No, it's when times get tough. Oh, God. The psalmist said, I complain morning, noon, and evening. I murmur. You continue to pray because prayer is in the fire and you see God and you get shaped. You pray. And then you, number four, you trust in God. Have faith in God, Jesus said. It's that simple. And you have faith over time. You wait. I will wait for God only. God, come through. I'm waiting on you. I'm trusting in you. God, I have no recourse. I'll do what I can do with doctors, lawyers, teachers, anything I can. But ultimately, it's coming down to you. We've all been there. Number five, you know as your rock that he is your fortress and your shield and your buckler. God knows me. The psalmist said, when my, when my way was overwhelmed within me, thou, O Lord, didst know my path. When I didn't know where I was, you knew where I was. You know, it's amazing that Peter walked on the water. You know what's even more amazing? When he took his eyes off Jesus and he sank, that he sank slowly. You ever sunk slowly in water? God can let you sink slowly. He'll grab you. And they went back to the boat together. And I guarantee you, when Peter went back to the boat, he, he was looking at Jesus every step of the way. You know, my own hurt sometimes. I have two sons. There have been times they have hurt. My son John got T-boned. He's a cop in Fort Worth. He got T-boned last week. Got a concussion. As soon as I found out, I said, we got to go down there. Tommy's a 30-plus-year-old boy. He's got Kevlar. He carries guns. He shoots people for a living. <laughs> it's my baby. <laughs> you know, usually the mother's the sensitive is the father. Teresa said, hey. <laughs> Sometimes you got to suck it up. <laughs> no, I got six grandkids, one little granddaughter, five grandsons. And all of my grandkids are like, they're thick, strong little fellas. They're just... They're like grabbing, you ever hugged a spiral ham? Yeah, they're, they're, they're like hugging a spiral ham. <laughs> Except for one of them, that's John Jenny's kid named Jake. Jake Benjamin told me, my son, he said, when you pick up Jake, it's like picking up a fish skeleton. <laughs> like a gar, you know. He's just long and lean and uh, bony. Remember Curious George? He looks like Curious George. And when that little fellow, he's got these big brown eyes, and he looks at me and says, Pops, and it breaks my heart. And there have been times that I've been in pain, and I've said, God, and I've just imagined me and Jake. God, if Jake utters a sound, I'm there. And you know what Jesus said? If you being evil give to your children good gifts, how much more shall your heavenly Father give to those who ask him? I'm not gonna, you're not going to ask for a fish and me give you a snake. You're going to ask for bread and me give you a scorpion or an egg give you a scorpion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. Even it's painful. So God, I said, I, I know what I'd do with Jake. Can you see me here? By faith, 
I feel you can. Sixthly, he has never failed me. One night when I was in my bed, I just started thinking back from the time prenatal on stuff I have been through, stuff even before I was born, and how God has never failed me. He has never let me be completely comfortable for any great length of time. But he's never failed me. And he will not fail me in what I go through now. He'll be with me. In the Holy of Holies, there's a jar of manna to never forget. Every day I was there. There's Aaron's rod. When you were in tough, when the Red Sea had to part, there it was. The rod that Aaron and Moses used. I'll take care of you. Big times, little times. Also, number seven, God is not through with me. He that began a good work will perfect it until the day of Christ. I would love to coast when you get your, you know, when you hit 65. But I know that God is going to take me all the way to the end to finish my course. Eighthly, I know that he's sovereign and that all things are not good, but they will work together for good. I don't care how screwy that puzzle piece looks, how misconfigured, it is designed to fit at some point. When stuff comes around it, it's going to fit. And I know he shapes me as much as he relieves me. That life is a fire. 1 Peter 5, 10. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will perfect Confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he will, he will raise you at the proper time. There's a clock running. And God knows what it is. And it's designed for me. I can trust you. As long as I know you're at the stick. That you're in control. Tenthly, I will not despise the discipline of God. Hebrews 12, 11, all discipline seems for the moment not to be sorrowful, but to be painful. Or not to be joyful, but to be painful. It's like a coach. I had coaches as a baseball player and a football player. And I had coaches that pushed me hard and gave me cotton mouth and made me run, made me at times drill and drill, and I didn't like it. But I liked winning and so I think back on Barton Ray and David Noble and Ken Riley. I think back on, on Woodrow Bruton, on James Burroughs, on John Vosick. Those men made me uncomfortable because they had dreams. And sometimes I see God as that coach. And sometimes I've said, God, whew, we got in a rough one today. Give me strength. Help me out. Number 11, you rest in the word. You surround yourself. If you can read, sometimes it's so painful you can't read. I read best on tough times. I will just inundate myself in the Bible. And it's like it's got my name all over it. I also pray and ask for God to give wisdom like Solomon to guide him and where he's going. Sometimes James 1, 5, ask for wisdom, he gives to all men generously. What that means is, God, I'm in a minefield, I'm in an ice flow with a metal boat, and I need you to guide me through this, because it's all chess with you, you're three moves ahead, help me. And sometimes you sing and you glory in the things that are unchangeable. Spurgeon used to say, always sing. If you can sing when you're happy, you've got to be able to sing when you're sad. Try it. I've done it before. One time I took a Cokesbury hymnal and I was just driving around with it. And I was trying it. Boy, you don't sing real good when you're sad. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness in my Lord so dear. But you know it worked. You just sing. And then 
you look beyond this life. First verse I ever memorized was right before Hayden Fry cut me from North Texas State football. I was a fifth-year senior. He said, we're not going to lose with a fifth-year senior. We're going to have to lose with a freshman. You're gone. I had memorized the verse. My first one. I still got it today. Our light affliction, which is just for a moment, worketh for a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, Hayden Fry, <laughs> but at the things which are unseen. This world is bigger, or this in the world isn't as big as God wants to do. You know, this life, in the old days, you broke a leg or something, you could die. You could get a rotten tooth and die of an abscess. You were always ready for glory. Now, we got specialists on everything. We got head problems. We got neurologists. We got orthopedic guys. We got podiatrists for your feet. We got back guys. We got it all. We got proctologists, you know. <laughs> How many of you guys just felt your blood run cold right there? Yeah. <laughs> And so we think when we got a problem, I got CVS, I got Walgreens. But really, we got guys that can postpone stuff and alleviate stuff. Hallelujah. But it's almost like we think that we're made for this earth. You ever thought sometimes you don't belong here? Maybe it's because you don't. You're made for somewhere else. It's been said, we are not human beings going through a temporary spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings going through a temporary human experience. 14, prove your faith. Show the world that the proof of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor. You stand tough. Spurgeon said, when you're hurting, you stand tough. You trusting in the king, let it be known. And then you walk one more step. That's what faithfulness is. I said to Scott Talbot, whose wife Susanna has gone through chemo, brutal rounds of chemo the last couple of years. I said, are you just married to the toughest woman in Texas? I said, how's she doing? Scott says, she's tough one day at a time. And know that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. W.L. and Joy Brown, Walt Dyer, Lori Collins, my buddy John Bowles, his sweet little wife Sarah, 59 years old, went out to get the paper, sat down to read it, and couldn't understand the words. Checked out her head, tumor. Two months, she's gone. My best friend is now a widower. At 63. Man, if little Sarah, and I've thought this at times, if Sarah can do this, I can do this. If Lori Collins can do this, who cleaned my teeth down there from Mark Morris, if she could do this and pass away with cancer, I can do this. And lastly, Christ is here. Narnia Chronicles, you ever read The Horse and His Boy? Aslan, the great lion, the little children are moving through the book. They're in a tomb. It's scary. A little cat comes up and crawls on their lap, and they just pet it. They're going along a mountain road. They sense a great form walking beside them, hearing the deep breathing and seeing the shadow of this lion walking on the edge of the mountain road. They're running for help, and the horses are getting tired. It doesn't look like they're going to make it. And all of a sudden, a lion comes out of the forest, scratches the horse on the shank. The horse takes off with added fervor, and they reach their destination. Aslan, the Christ figure, says, I was that cat when you were scared. I was that little cat. When you were on that scary road, that was me, keeping you where you should be. And when you had to pick up the speed, I was the one that scared you. I'm whatever I need to be to you. So I'm there. And he cares. He could stop it. He can stop it. Someday he will stop it. But until then, he got plans. 
You got a minute? What time are we playing today? Does it matter? <laughs> Life has no meaning. <laughs> True story. University of Alabama, it's a quarterback named A.J. McCarron, has three national championship rings on his fingers. He wasn't supposed to live. When he was five years old, he got hit by a wave runner. Yeah, creased his head, knocked his eye out of socket. They said to his mother, he may not live. If he does, he's going to have severe brain damage. Well, he did well enough to go to college, get a scholarship, go to Alabama and quarterback him for three years and be a Heisman contender, A.J. McCarron. Well, he comes to that hospital every Christmas Eve because it's a children's hospital and he remembers those kids. He was a kid that was scared to death and so he's sympathetic and he comes there for those kids. And two years ago, whenever Alabama got beat early in the year by LSU and beat him at the end of the year, won the national championship, two years ago he goes to that hospital on Christmas Eve and he sees a little old bitty three-year-old African-American girl named Starla Chapman who has just contracted childhood leukemia, and it's bad. And she also happened to love Alabama. She always had her Alabama cheerleader dress on. If you ask her about it, she'd say, roll time. <laughs> little Alabama draw. And she loved A.J. McCarron. And here she was with the most important guy, A.J. McCarron. And she gave A.J. a bracelet. Her father made bracelets that said, Just trust. Because he was scared to death. He said, I'm about to lose my baby maybe. She's got leukemia. It's a parent's worst nightmare. And she would say to her daddy, Daddy, just trust. Just trust. Meaning, we can't do anything. God's here. She's been to Sunday school. Just trust. Just trust. So they made bracelets, just trust. A.J. came to see her and she asked him, she said, would you wear my bracelet? You think he did? He knew what it was to be in that bed. He said, give me that bracelet. And he put it on his throwing hand. He said, this bracelet will never come off. I'm going to wear it in the national championship game. The week before they played LSU, she had cardiac arrest. And they almost lost her. They worked on her, brought her back the night of the game. That's where she was. She was hooked up to every tube that you could. But she had a TV right above her in critical care unit. They were playing LSU and had her family there. The doctors were there. And that little starlet wanted to be able to hear whether Alabama beat LSU. The night of that game, of course, A.J. McCarron had a great game. They won, won the national championship. And whenever he would do something great, boy, the crowd would swell on that, on that television. And her mother said that her blood pressure would go boom, 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 boom. And then it would mild on down. Then something else would happen. Roll tide. Boom, 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 boom. That child is literally vicariously got the heart of McCarran in her. He plays, she lives. He plays, she lives. They score, she lives. And she keeps making it through, listening to Alabama. Well, her mother noticed something. And this is when this girl takes a turn for the best. They walk, uh, McGarren walks up to the line. Of course, there's 100,000 people. They're all screaming. You can't hear anything. So if you're going to check your playoff, if you're going to audible, you can't call it because nobody can hear you. You had to give hand signals. Not like when I was at North Texas, people used to call down from the stands. They'd say, hey. <laughs> Run the option. <laughs> he said, I don't want the ball. <laughs> Audibles. <laughs> now her father or her mother said that they resumed the camera down. A.J. McCarron throws his hands out. And he's, they're looking back, 
and he's giving the signals what they're going to do and the camera comes up close and they're on national TV they got that hand and that mother says Starla there's your bracelet and they could see it just trust and she saw it and it was like this is the most important event in Alabama most important event in our state this is the guy that's the kingpin this is AJ McCarron and he's thinking of me he's got me on his mind he's with me and her heart just swelled up within her she makes it through that game after the game McCarron had to have surgery on his shoulder he comes to the same hospital that she's at and uh, guess who he grabbed while he was at the hospital you got this all-american and you got this little bitty three-year-old and do you know what uh, Starla Chapman's parents made AJ McCarron the legal godfather of this girl where do you think she's going to college <laughs> it's a smart daddy right there and so he is her legal godfather and he to this day has never taken off that bracelet she's always on his heart she survived she's gone to kindergarten now her mother's got her a little sister for her and she is it may not always work this way but she's cancer free now that's that's the sympathy of Christ God I'm hooked up on tubes really you just trust you just trust me I'm right here father in heaven such is Christmas I think of the words of the angel this shall be a sign you'll find a baby in swaddling a newborn lying in a manger that is Christ the Lord you will find the king of the universe in a donkey's feeding trough and there ain't but one no other place will have this you're here for us amen